these are the, the, the topics that we need to, to remember. Uh, if I want to show you how to define a class, we can do this in the next minutes. Okay, so it's just a keyword. Uh, you already have some knowledge regarding structures because you work with data structures. So classes are similar to those. So we need only five minutes to learn how to define a class, maybe less than five minutes. Now, the, the real issue is not to define the class, like define it, uh, name it, and that's it. The real issue is what do you write inside the class? So you will see we have attributes, which are variables, and we have actions, which are functions. So functions are, let's say, one of the two main components of a class, okay? You have the description and the functionality, the behavior. So knowing how to define functions, methods, or subprograms, it doesn't matter how you call them. Let's establish that they all mean the same. So if you call them functions, method, or subprograms, I don't care. What's most important is to know how to define any function, okay? And after that, to use them, okay? So methods, functions, subprograms are uh, uh, very important. Now, this is for your general, let's say, knowledge, because maybe at some point during the project, maybe during an assignment, during something, you need to sort the data, okay? This is a common, let's say, algorithm. So you need to know at least one sorting algorithm. Which one you can choose? You know, uh, in programming, uh, there is a saying regarding, uh, or there is a universal answer to the question, which is the, the easiest solution to do something. And the universal uh, uh, answer is the solution you know, because that's the easiest for you, the easiest solution for you, okay? The one you know, you understand, you can fix it if you have uh, uh, issues there. So again, here, you can choose any sorting algorithm, interchange, bubble sort, quick sort, whatever, okay? But you should be able to be able to sort them. Again, this is another, another common sense uh, thing that we will do with uh, values searching. So here, I think everybody knows how to search in a sequential way. You just go through all the values and check them and so on. Okay, and using Visual Studio, yeah, this is what I need to change because it's only one if use, using Visual Studio 2019, editing, compiling, running, and debugging. With those of you who had the laboratories this week, we actually, we started the recap with this. And uh, I will uh, do also some, um, uh, let's say, some tutorials. Okay, so from these things that we need to remember, I will start with, uh, with data types. And uh, here I will focus on pointers. So all day long will be, uh, about pointers, okay? You see it's right here, uh, recap some C concepts, pointers, pointers to value, static and dynamic arrays, string of arrays of charts, function pointers. Uh, this is uh, quite complex. So I will leave this for maybe another discussion uh, after we, we cover all the other major points from this course, uh, pointers to functions. References will be introduced because we are in C++. And again, functions, methods, and uh, parameters transfer, okay? And these are macros. Uh, I told you that uh, at, uh, let's say, after each two, three uh, uh, interval of uh, weeks, I will give you a form, like a feedback form. And uh, I will ask you from all the topics that uh, we did during those last uh, two or three weeks, which are the, the topics which you sh for which you still need help? Okay, because maybe you got the idea, but you are only half of the way uh, till the, the final objective to truly understand that. So let's say next week, I will give you a, a feedback form after we do uh, the next course. Okay, so I will give you a, a feedback form and uh, we will see which are the topics that still require um, extra discussions. And uh, I will schedule a supplementary meeting for let's say one hour, uh, two hours, uh, I will establish it. So uh, I will check your, um, your schedule and I will try to schedule it so your colleagues from third year can attend. Okay, so I'll try to find uh, an interval then uh, at which uh, you are all available, let's say. And if you have questions on those topics, okay, and I, I believe you will have because I will get your feedback from the form, I will answer to your questions. Okay, because if I say the same story as I told you already during the course uh, and you didn't got the, uh, the concepts, 
then you need to help me find a way to reach you, okay? And in order to do that, you need to ask me, okay? Because based on your questions, I can actually see where is the issue. What's the topic that prevents you from uh, understanding the, the story there, okay? So you need to ask me. Like I said, I will use your questions to actually see how you, uh, you see that stuff, okay? Because in my mind, I, I can think that everything is clear, but in reality, that's not. Okay, so let's open um, Visual Studio. You already have the, the source code from the mo uh, mon Monday laboratories, if we do the seminar together. Okay, if not, you can check them, they are public. And also uh, after today, you will find this, uh, these examples. So if you, want, if you just want to pay attention and try to understand the, uh, the discussion, you can do that because you will get the source code after this meeting. And uh, maybe in that way, you can actually focus on what I'm doing or what I'm saying. And uh, you will just take notes regarding things that uh, may sound important, okay? Because if you code uh, in parallel with me, maybe it will be uh, difficult to write and listen in the same time, okay? But if you can do that, uh, code uh, with me in parallel, that will be okay. But like I said, you, you get this source code. So you just, you don't need to write it. And also you get the, the recording, okay? So you can go through the recording and do the examples again. Like I said, we start always with uh, empty projects, okay? Uh, C++ projects. And uh, always check here what's your uh, language, okay? So it's C++, not uh, anything else. Okay, let's switch this to, because I have here courses, okay? So this is what you will see on, uh, on GitHub. You will see a folder called courses, and here you will see the, the course. And just to keep them sorted by name, I will use this um, numbering style because this is week two, okay? We had the first course last week, so I will just keep them in sync with the week number, which is uh, the second week of the semester. Okay, create. So let's add uh, a source code to, to this, okay? So a source CPP, again, I'm checking the, um, the language because otherwise we will use by mistake a different compiler. Okay, so I have the, the source file. Let's move the zoom toolbar here. Generally, I don't need because in the, in the first weeks we will uh, cover very simple examples. So a single source file uh, will be uh, sufficient. So I will just minimize the solution explorer. A very important window, remember, is the error list because I, I always want to see what will happen every time I'm typing and you will see a lot of errors. Again, we will cover them each time. Uh, I will show you the reason. So the error list is, is very important. And if you don't have that window, again, all the windows here in this environment are managed by from here. You see view and you see all here, you, you have access to all the windows that Visual Studio can uh, provide. And at any point, if something will mess up because it's very easy, uh, you can easily move this window from uh, the bottom and they will mess up on the screen. So every time that will happen and you want to reset the layout of your windows, you have here a window, let's see, a window or um, help. Uh, where is that? Uh, where is the reset layout? Yeah, I think this is it, yeah. So window, uh, reset window layout, okay? And this will reset all the windows to their default uh, location, state, whatever, okay? so. And sometimes it's easy because you can easily do a drag and drop without actually uh, wanting to do that. Okay, let's create a, a program, okay? And um, I already told your colleagues that um, here I will um, always define main and saying I'm returning an integer because we always return an exit code. And that exit code is very important because uh, it will tell us uh, if we have uh, runtime exceptions or if we have bugs during uh, our execution. You know, maybe some of you wrote this, which is okay, you can write this, but uh, by default, this will always return an exit code. So if I'm running this program, I will still, still see that exit code in the command prompt window. So officially main returns an integer. And officially, when your program terminates gracefully, which means everything was okay, you return exit code zero. And exit code zero means no errors. 
Now, because this will always happen, this is, let's say, redundant because the compiler will add this line for us. So you can do this without it. But let's say officially, this is sufficient. Now, officially, this is the simplified version of main because the official version of main is that one which also receives arguments here. Like, I yeah, please. Um, I can see that uh, there is no library added. And I was wondering if there is a library that is practically used. In no. So right now, um, we don't need any library because here you can, you, I can do a, a very simple program in VB equals 20. And here I will say int VB2 equals VB plus 10. Okay. So at this point, VB plus 10. So at this point, if I want to execute this, I can. Okay, so just he go here, build, build solution. It's building the solution. And now I will get an XA, which is called, uh, um, let's say, course 02XA. And if I run this, again, uh, we will use both options here, start debugging and start without debugging because generally we will try to see the output. So the first option will be to use start without debugging. And after that, if something goes wrong, if you have a strange exit code or you have a, a runtime exception, you see that pop up saying that something awful has happened, we run it in debugger, okay? So we will always use both options in this order. Start without debugging, start debugging. So if I run this now, start without debugging or control F5, let me show you your, uh, also the command prompt. You see, uh, I see the process name, Core02XA. Uh, I see the process ID number, okay? And I see exited with code zero. Now you may say that this return zero comes from here because I have a return zero. So let's comment this one. Okay, let's run this again. Build, rebuild solution, debug start without debugging. Okay, let me show you the, the window, the command prompt. Okay, and again, it's saying exited with code zero. Okay, even if I commented the return zero, because remember by default, all the processes will return an exit code. If, an, if you don't want to make that uh, something to be, uh, I don't know, conscious. Okay, so that will always happen. So every time we will run a program, we will always check this value here because if it's not zero, we have an issue. So even if your program does not show you the pop-up window regarding a runtime exception has happened and it's asking you what we want to do, a break, cancel, or ignore. And the only option valid there that you should always follow is break, don't use continue or ignore. Even if that will not happen and you see here a strange number, don't look up that number on Stack Overflow because sometimes is generated by the system. It's, it's not a standard error number. We will run the program again in debugger because it means we have a, an issue, okay? So always, we will always check this here. Regarding your, your colleague question, at this moment, we can actually do a lot of stuff. I don't know, define an array, manage the array values and a lot of stuff. But you see, I can only use common uh, operations like uh, op uh, mathematical operations, things which are already known by the compiler. The real issue will, um, will happen if we want to print these messages. Because if we want to print these messages, our process needs to interact with the operating system. So for that case, we will uh, use a function, okay? so. If you write very simple basic applications, which are not printing any messages, they are just counting some numbers and that's it. And obviously some of you will say, so what's the reason for just doing some computations and not printing the results? I don't know, it makes no sense. Or uh, why we are not uh, uh, writing those uh, values in, in files? Again, makes no sense. So generally our programs, will interact with the environment, either the console, either the uh, uh, file system, either the network or a database, whatever, okay? And in order to do those interactions, obviously we need help. And this is where we need uh, libraries, but we don't actually need libraries to do this kind of stuff. Okay, so 
let's um, um, print a message because printing a message, uh, it's a common stuff. Now in C, most of you have used this and uh, this will be the last time we will use it. So this will be like uh, by by C, hello C++, okay? Because if I need print F, you see the, this is another common error, which we will see many times. It's saying identifier is undefined and which means the compiler has no clue which is printf. And here we remember that we don't need to define a, a printf method because there is one in, in a library, which is a C library called standard input output. Okay, so here I will say include standard input output dot h. Okay, which is a C system library. And remember C++ can uh, use C uh, libraries. Okay, so that's why here we can use this C library. Okay, because we need this, uh, this kind of external uh, functions. Yeah, in those cases, you need libraries because in many cases, we don't want to reinvent something that exists. This is the power of programming. We can actually reuse anything that others have done before us. And in that way, we are uh, productive. So now I have this message. Yeah, let's, uh, let's move this in, uh, in the C++ way. So starting today, we will use a library or we will use uh, C++ functions, which will do the same stuff. And those functions are called output uh, stream operators. Okay, that's their name. And those functions uh, are actually operators because the equivalent of printf is this one. And the equivalent of scanf, which was the function you were using last year to read from the console is this one, okay? So these are the functions equivalent to printf. This is for printf, this is for scanf. And you see in C++, there are called streams. Why there are called streams? Because in C, this is actually a library which has been designed to manage files and hence the name for it. STDIO stands for standard input output. And if you remember from first year from the operating system course in Windows and in Linux, there are some standard files and they are called standard out, output, standard input, standard error, standard printer, and so on. So in, in those windows, including, you have those standard files because that was the, let's say, the legacy way of processes to communicate with the environment, with the operating system. So here, printf is actually dumping this string in a file and is announcing the operating system, hey, we just dump some strings there, just output them to the console because the console is managed by the operating system. Okay? I, I have a question yeah, because you talked about the uh, standard. <laughs> Uh, I remember in high school when we used something uh, using a namespace uh, standard. Mm -hmm. so what... I will explain you. Uh, I will explain. So what was the question? Question is, uh, what is that like? Could mm -hmm. you please explain why? We okay, use why we are using that and why we? I was memorizing that as a student. Yes. Okay. And everybody is memorizing it. Let's not let's not memorize it, because okay. actually that's something that we do in school. In production, they never do that. And this is another thing that it's like it's like a, a stamp on on your front end. It's like newbie when you are using the using namespace standard because in in uh, production they don't use that. And I will explain you why. Okay, so starting today, we will use streams. What's the difference? These streams are not working with the standard input output files because the hard drive is the slowest component in your computer, or even if it's a solid state drive or an M2. So it's the, the, the slowest component. So they replace the files with buffer streams, like very large array of chars, which are kept in memory in RAM because RAM is very fast. Okay, so in terms of speed of memory, you have the cache memory, which is inside the, the processor. You have the RAM, which is the next in terms of speed. And after that, you have the, the hard drive. Okay, which let's say even solid state drives or M2, uh, they are slower than the RAM speed. Okay, so they replace the files with streams which are kept in, in memory. So from this uh, perspective, we can say that C++ applications will work faster than C ones 
uh, when we print to the console because they are not using the hard drive. They are not using the files as a temporary buffer. Okay, so now the, the stream is in, um, uh, in memory. Now, every time you will use this word stream, this always means an array of bytes, okay? An array of chars. So a stream is actually a continuous space of bytes or chars, an array of chars. Okay, so how do I write the same stuff? Maybe I think some of you already know that. So C out is the name of that standard output stream in, in memory. And you see it's called C out because this is actually the acronym for console out. So this is a buffer. This is a buffer in RAM, okay? And here you are, uh, we were writing this in a file. Okay, so now C out. And now I run to write the same stuff, which is equivalent. So I will say C out, hello C++. Okay, now you see, uh, this is an operator, okay? So it's not a function. Operators are functions because we will overload them. But for the moment, we can see it as an operator. So I don't need the brackets. And um, uh, maybe it's more clear because you see, uh, this is also giving us the direction of the stream, which means take this array of chars, this string, and copy it here based on the direction, okay? It's like a, a traffic uh, indicator, okay? Go to the left, okay? So it's dumped here in the uh, standard buffer. Okay, now again, we have the same error. Identifier C out is undefined because again, C out is not my own variable. It's a system variable, I just explained you, uh, which is the equivalent of the standard buffer stream buffer in RAM for uh, working with the console. So in order to you, uh, tell to the compiler, hey, this identifier, this variable is already defined by uh, the C++ SDK software development kit, just include this, include IO, and you see again, input output stream, okay? So if you remember that that's a stream, okay? And again, IO, it's easy to remember the name of this library. Another difference here is that here, this name here does not have .h. And this is the convention that they used in order to allow developers to actually uh, see which are C language libraries versus C++ language libraries. So this is the, the convention. So every time you see source code on Stack Overflow, on, on different tutorials, and they are doing something, and you see here .h libraries, that's, that's a C language program. We can still use that in C++ because like I said, this is the way they design in C++, but those are from the C language libraries, okay? So all the C++ libraries, they don't have the .h, okay? They are missing the .h and all the C uh, legacy C libraries, they have the .h. Now, our objective here is to write programs in C++ because we said we will write C++. So generally we will try to have uh, solutions that will have only libraries without a .h, which means we are using only C++ specific libraries, okay? So th that's why some of them, they have the .h, some are not. Okay, now, why do we have here the same error again? So C out is, is still an error. It's still saying it's undefined because C++ is cross-platform, which and C is cross-platform which means we can take this C, C++ uh, program and we can compile it with the proper comp compiler for, I don't know, for an ARM processor, microprocessor, or for an Intel microprocessor, or for, I don't know, Texas Instruments microprocessor, okay? So this means cross-platform. You can take the same source code and using the proper compiler, you can translate this to machine code, which is interpreted by different microprocessors, which have different architectures because they are not all Intel. Even if Intel is doing about this one, they are not all Intel. Okay, so because of that, you need to be aware that on different machines with different microprocessors, the console can be something completely different than what we, what we see when we play on a Windows machine on an Intel processor. So the console could be a file. The console can, could be something that does not exist and so on and so on. The console could be, I don't know, a hardware uh, pin, which I don't know, sends some messages and so on. So because 
the console is not universal. And because of that, because we can write C++ uh, languages which are cross-platform, when we are using IO stream, which is the input output stream library, it means that in order to write these cross-platform uh, programs, we don't know if they have the standard console as we know it or a different console. So in order to allow us to uh, use here the same library, but to also use specific resources to something we know as the standard console, here in this library, there are actually collections of functions which are, let's say, designed for some specific uh, use cases, okay? Some, for some specific hardware or uh, scenarios. And actually uh, a lib or a, a collection of methods and variable, it's called a namespace. So a namespace is actually a block of code between curly braces, which can define several methods and variables. And the advantage of using a namespace is that, let's define, let's see if we can define here a namespace, namespace. Okay, let's say my variables. Okay, this is a namespace. Okay, here you, you have a namespace. The advantage of having namespaces is that here you can define a variable called VB. And if you define another namespace here, so these are called my variables, these are called your variables. Okay, here I can define an int VB and here I can define another int VB. Now, Without namespaces, if you define two variables with the same name, you get the compiler error saying, hey, you have two variables with the same name. Great. Now, when you will write VB, to which one do you refer? And this is the compiler asking you because it, it can't guess, okay? So using namespaces, you can separate the purpose of uh, different variables and still keep their name. Okay, so this is what exists here. And because most, uh, most of our programs, not most, all of them, will use the standard output, the standard console, because we are on a, a Windows machine and we have the standard uh, console. It means that actually here the compiler cannot find C out because C out is defined many times here in this IO stream libraries, uh, library in different namespaces. Like I said, for different use cases, different devices. So what the compiler actually uh, saying, hey, there is no global C out there. So we need to be more explicit by saying standard C out. So it's like, hey, you see this library, IO stream? I want to use the standard console because I'm, a, uh, I'm on a standard machine. I, I have a console. Okay, so that's why C out, even if we include the library here, we still need to use this prefix because otherwise the compiler will have no idea from which namespace. And this is a namespace here and there are other many namespaces. So if I want to access VB from my variables- but what are they? What are they what? Namespaces? And name the namespaces in- Yeah, the namespaces are just collections of uh, functions uh, of uh, and variables and that's it. So a namespace is not like a class or a, or a structure, you can't, initialize a, a namespace. A namespace is like a page. You know, it's like, hey, you see this sequence? Uh, I want to include all those variables and functions uh, from that sequence in this collection called namespace, whatever. It's just a way to structure your source code. So if uh, we were to use the uh, VB variable, exactly, you would have to specify like we did there with C Exactly, you see? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So now I will say VB from my variables is 10. And now if I say your variables, VB is 20, which means we have two different variables with the same name. This is actually the advantage of namespaces because you, you, you don't need to invent variable or function names, you keep you just recycle the names and the, for the variables and functions. And because otherwise you'll have, uh, you can't define multiple variables and functions with the same name, you can include them in different namespaces. And after that is, is your job because the compiler will not be able to decide is your job to, to uh, specify 
the namespace from which you want to use that variable. Because if I write here VB equals 30, I will get the compiler error saying, who is VB? Okay? So in this way, you can recycle uh, variable names, okay? Now, if you work on your project and uh, you know you will use the same variables, like sum, like counter, whatever, how do you make sure that uh, when you uh, combine your source code, let's, let's suppose you do the project in two, and uh, after that, one of you will get the source code from uh, his colleague or her colleague and uh, bring the, that source code in, in the main project. If you use the same variables, at some point you, you will get compiler errors because you both define the same variables maybe in main. So how do you keep them uh, splitted? Each of you can define its own namespace, okay? And your source code, yeah, will always be like this. Okay, so this is actually a namespace. It's just a way to, I don't know, to group together functions and variables. And generally, this is the way you will uh, see a lot of examples in uh, official documentation of C++ in a lot of uh, tutorials over the internet. Because in production, you will write C++ source code for, I don't know, for a BMW automatic brake. And maybe you want to reuse that source code for, I don't know, for a Volkswagen brake and so on. So you will never know if you have the standard console, maybe you want to log those messages. And obviously the, the break does not have a console, okay? You send those, um, those signals to the, through the vehicle bus. So you don't have a, a console there. So in that way, in order to, to keep your C++ source code uh, independent from external resources that may exist or not, when you use the uh, standard uh, console, you need to specify which console. Okay, the standard one or another one from another namespace, which is from another library, which is specific to those um, devices. Okay, so in this way, you will see uh, examples of our internet in many cases, and the official documentation will always write code like this. You will always see this. Okay, now, generally, we will write software for Windows. Okay, we, we will not change anything during this semester. Okay, so we will have the same platform. So normally this will be very annoying because yeah, it's time consuming, okay? To write this, see out, in, instead of backslash N, I can use, they have an alias in C++ for backslash N, which is called end, end line. So let's use it. So I will say C out. And again, if I write here end line, again, it's saying is undefined because end line differs. And this you should remember from operating systems. So, you know, enter is not the same on Windows and Linux, okay? Enter on uh, Linux and Windows, it's a different key code because from one uh, platform, uh, it uh, represents two values, carriage return line feed, so two bytes. And for another pr uh, platform is just line feed, okay? Only one byte. Okay, so again, end line, it could be different values for different platforms. And again, here I, I want to say, hey, it's just the standard end line. So again, I need to write this. Okay. And, and when I write standard uh, two points to points, you see all the possibilities that I can use from the standard namespace. Okay. Remember, if you don't see this uh, pop up, I don't know, maybe you close it by mistake, control space. Okay. So control space will activate the IntelliSense uh, and they autocomplete. So this is all the stuff that the standard namespace contains from the IO stream, okay, library. Okay, so here I want to say end line. End line, and here I will say, um, I don't know, hello C++, recap on pointers. Okay, so again, v VB is unknown because VB is not anywhere here, it's just there in the net space. So let's build, rebuild, or just build. It doesn't matter. Just build, build, or rebuild is the same, or clean is the same for, um, for our project. And now let's run this. Debug, start without debugging. Let's share the screen with you. And we see what? Bye bye C, hello C, recap on pointers. Okay. And again, I'm checking exit code zero. 
Okay, you see the process ID every time is a different one because that's the operating system managing this uh, very short, simple application, okay? But this doesn't matter, this value doesn't matter. Always check this one, the exit code. Okay, so this is very annoying. Uh, and this is related with what your colleague uh, uh, asked earlier. Why are we writing something and we all memorize that? Now, what I want for you to see is that at this point, this program works and we didn't need it to write that stuff. And by staff, I, I think I, you were referring to this one, using namespace standard. So why are we sometimes using using namespace standard? Because when I, I write this instruction, I will actually tell to the compiler, hey, if you see some variables like C out, like end line, and those variables are not defined by me, try to look for them here, okay, in the standard namespace. That's why here you have the using namespace standard, because at some point you'll be, I don't know, you want to write faster uh, code. So instead of writing each time standard C out, C out, you just want to type this. Okay, C out, uh, end line. Okay, let's uh, take a break. Okay, for example, because you just want to focus on easy stuff and not write standard two points to points each time, because if you do this many times, you, you will lose, let's say, lose minutes by just writing this stuff. That's why we have the using namespace standard. Okay, so this is just a shortcut. But like I said, in production projects, they are not doing this because this is very dangerous. Because if a developer is doing this stuff here and this source code just grow, grow, grow and become a very large source code, at some point, everybody will forget that all the variables or the, let's say, uh, system variables are actually looked into the standard namespace. And maybe you don't want to do that. So at this point, this, this source code will use by default the, the standard namespace. And this is sometimes it's dangerous because no one will give you any compiler errors or warnings. This is a decision that some of the developers uh, has made. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So um, we basically can just use namespace my variables and type all the variables then that we need, and then we write my variables double points all the time, or we say like using namespace my variables. You want to access this easier, right? Uh, yeah. This yeah. VB from here, and you don't want to write my variables two points, two points each time, right? That was the question. Yes, exactly. Okay, so at this point, if you want to say to the compiler, hey, every time that I'm writing VB, uh, by default, you should check it here. I will go here and say using namespace, my variables, sorry. Okay, so every time I will write VB equals, you see earlier we had the compiler error, now we don't have, and just check uh, when I click on it, uh, how Visual Studio will highlight it. And it's actually saying, hey, you see this gray highlighted variable? This one here is actually this one and is actually this one here. Okay, now what do you think will happen if you write here also after this line using namespace your variables? What do you think will happen? So if- I think we will get an error again. Exactly, but the error name will be different because now the compiler will see two VB variables, right? Because you have a VB in my variables and a VB in your variables. So you see now the error is different. Is saying VB is ambiguous. Why is ambiguous? Because this VB could be this one and this one. And it can't yeah. be uh, two different variables in the same time. Okay? But in this case, the uh, standard and my variables, they don't really cancel each other out. No, no, because uh, there is nothing in a standard uh, like VB. Okay. Yes. Uh, before uh, this uh, example with my variables and your variables, okay. not that uh, we, we write only one time using namespace because otherwise. Yeah. You because generally we we will use only the standard namespace. Exactly. Uh, no, I mean if yeah. 
prefer to write another after standard, another time using namespace, this my variables. I yeah. hope that uh, in a C out, we will have to write uh, standard uh, to that. Yeah, exactly. So uh, let me uh, see if I, I got your question. So let's suppose here I will write a, another using namespace, another namespace, right? Which also yes. defines C out, right? Yes. So if you include, if you say using namespace two times with two different namespaces, let's say standard and extra, okay? And they both have C out. In order to eliminate the is ambiguous for C out, yeah, in that case, you are again forced to use the namespace name two dots. So in order to fix this error, now is the developer job to actually say which one is. Is either this one or the other one? Because by just writing VB, it's ambiguous. And is there a way to sort of close the namespace? Uh, no, to say, hey, from this point on, don't use the namespace anymore. Yes. No. So the general rule here is try not to use using and the namespace. This is actually the rule. Try not to use this one. Try not to write using namespace. Always prefix your variables with the namespace name and don't be a lazy developer. Write that anytime and you will eliminate a lot of very uh, nasty bugs in the future which will not trigger compiler errors, okay? So this will be the rule. Try not to uh, exaggerate with using namespace. Write this every time, okay? Now, fortunately for our uh, programs, we, I will not go into, I don't know, splitting our very simple programs in many namespaces because it will make no sense. It will be, just make the code uh, much more confusing. Uh, okay, and generally we will use the namespace standard. And because I just want to keep you in the both words, sometimes I will say using namespace, sometimes I will not write using namespace, and I will uh, obviously always write standard prefix here. And if we were to say use uh, using namespace in uh, main, for mm -hmm. example, if uh, there were another function, then uh, they won't use that namespace. One answer will be there is no uh, way of saying not use namespace anymore, okay? And um, remember the C++ compiler will always check the source code in this order. So once the compiler has seen this, this is it, okay? It will use that namespace. But if that namespace was a function, I mean- uh, If the namespace is a function, is in a function and we say ah, ah the namespace is in a function so yes, in that case the namespace is visible only inside the function okay thank but, you but but by fun. default let's just continue because this is a very interesting uh, direction uh, what you just said in a function you already have a default namespace which is the local scope of the function you know every time you open a function and you write something here, like, I don't know, do something, do something, uh, okay. By just opening, come on, uh, something, uh, okay. By just opening the brackets, you already have a namespace, which is by default associated with do something. So all the variables will be visible here and only here. The variables that you define here, like VB, okay? okay? So it makes no sense. You will just, uh, I don't know, uh, make very hard for others to read your source code to define a namespace, namespace here in this function. I, I never saw a reason to do that, okay? Because we anyway have to declare them in a function, right? Exactly. And if you define something in a function, this is what we will talk today, uh, it remains inside the function. It's not visible outside the function. That's why they are called local to the function. Okay, thank so you. namespaces, namespaces make sense here in the global scope, okay? Somewhere where they are globally visible. But this is another topic uh, and um, one of your colleagues uh, reminded me this uh, uh, this week.
uh, generally we will not use global variables because um, object oriented as a philosophy does not allow them okay and they are the reason for a lot of uh, huge mistakes and that's why all pure uh, let's say object oriented languages like uh, c sharp java they remove uh, the global variables entirely we still have global variables here global because remember c++ allows us to actually use c the c way of writing code okay so this is the global variable but maybe this will be the only time that i will do this just to show you what's a global variable if you don't know what's a global variable you are a happy programmer good for you if some of you have been able to solve some solutions with global variables i don't know let's make a, a, you know those meetings uh, for uh, programmers which are using global variables okay it's like hey my name is katarina I'm, I'm i'm using global variables okay and let's try to do a group to try to help each other to actually remove them okay because um, you know what's the issue with global variables they are global which means that any function any module any library in your project can see them and they can change them and you will have no clue about that no one will notify you no one will say hey you know your friend is not your friend the programmer from desk whatever number he, he just changed your global variable from its module and he has no idea and you also have no idea that's why we need to actually avoid them so i will never show you uh, uh, any solution with global variables okay and we will never use them because they create the impression that coding it's easy but when you dive into real projects, global variables are the reason for many, many uh, issues, like very difficult to find bugs. Because like I said, they are visible in, uh, from all your project and anyone can change them. Okay, so that's why we are sometimes writing using namespace standard. Because let's say we are lazy or I don't know, we want to type fast code. So we don't want to write standard uh, before each C out and end line and other symbols. Okay, so this could be the reason. So if someone is asking you, why are you writing this? The wrong answer is, let's say, let's establish the wrong answers because this is the only way I know or because we must. No, this is an option. So this is your option. And it's an option because you don't want to write the standard prefix uh, here and here. Okay, but there is a life without using namespace standard, and this is common for most uh, C and C++, uh, C++ developers. They always write this, okay? So if you find a tutorial where they write the code like this, it's a good one, okay? That one is written by a C++ developer. I think in schools, we are using this kind of stuff because we want to simplify uh, life for, for the participants okay so uh, let's check uh, the chat and after that uh, yeah let's take the the break okay so um we made the switch to c plus plus and doing that we we have seen why uh, what means standard why do we need for c out uh, end line and so on and yeah this was not uh, in the today program uh, regarding namespaces but because you asked and that's why it's important to ask because i can actually adjust the the course uh, presentation and the examples based on your question so if you are particularly interested in something i will change it so i, I don't have anything uh, predefined uh, i don't like to do that because i would get bored uh, okay so we also have seen the difference between uh, namespaces okay let's dive into uh, into pointers the first thing that we really need to establish in order to understand pointers is what are the resources that all our C, C++ programs will use? And the same story is available for Java, C Sharp, and other languages. So generally, the, the two resources that all our programs will use will be what? Variables, like these ones here, and functions. Great. So these are actually the building blocks of all our programs in many languages, not just C++. Functions and variables. Great. This is like uh, uh, asking Lego to produce only two, two pieces, okay? 
red and blue, and that's it. Functions and variables. So where, where are stored the variables? This is actually the real question. This is the, the main question that for which you should have an answer and sh you should be, let's say, uh, okay with the answer in order to understand pointers because everything starts with where are our variables? So let's define here, I have this function, do something, right? And here we have a VB. Now, um, because you see VB can be anything, it's very misleading. Yeah, I know it's a variable, okay? That's that's obvious, but what's the meaning of, uh, of that VB? Generally, I will not use generic names like VB, V1, V2, and so on. Generally, I will use uh, names which are meaningful. For example, here, I, I, I want to say integer value. Okay, so it's just an integer value, okay. Now I want to define another variable like char, let's say a char variable, okay. And uh, remember the data types, there is a, a keyword which we can use in C and C++, which is called short. So every time I, I will write short int, I and here I will have, let's say a short int value, okay. Uh, it means that here, I will use the, the integer as a two byte uh, value, okay? This generally means short because initially many years ago, integers, uh, the maximum size in terms of, uh, yeah, the size for integers was two bytes. And after that, uh, they increased the uh, processor's uh, architecture to let's say 64 bits or uh, to 32 bits from 16 bits and so on and so on. So right now, all the integers have um, uh, four bytes. This is the standard size. But if you still want to use an integer on its smallest size, which is two bytes, that's why you have short int, okay? So short int is like, hey, I want to use the integer as a two byte value, not a four byte value, 32 bits, uh, which is by default right now. Okay, so I have these variables. And they are here, you see in the do something. Now, if I copy these values, and again here, you see every time uh, I use a, a new noun here, uh, I always start with capital, but the first letter is all, always a small letter. And this is called a uh, mixed camel case. Okay, camel case, because if you draw the height of this word, it's like a profile of a camel, okay? Because each capital letter here will force you to go up and after that down, up, so for human eyes, this is very uh, helpful because our human, our eyes can easily detect the words by using a capital uh, letter here. And this is called uh, mixed camel case because the official camel case, which is used by .NET, uh, will always start with the capital, okay, like this. But uh, for variables and function, mm, doesn't look okay. So that's why it's called mixed camel case. It's like you start all the words with the capital letter with the exception of the first one, which is always a small one, okay? You see here, do something with capital S. Okay, so through, through the semester, we will use a mixed camel case, which is specific to, to Java. So camel case is specific to .NET, uh, .NET mixed camel case or Java camel case uh, is used by Java. Okay, now if I copy these variables here, okay, we already have some variables. So let's copy them here. And if we build this, build rebuild, okay, I don't have any issues. So earlier we have seen that if we have two variables with the same name, the compiler will always say, hey, that's confusing. It's ambiguous. I don't know which one do you want to use when you say that name, okay? But now we don't have any issues here. So it's like we have, but same variables, an integer, a char, and a short integer in main. And we have another set of the same variables here. And the compiler has no issue with this. And now the question is why? Because actually those variables are completely different. These are the variables from main, and these are the variables from do something. And each function behaves like a sandbox. You know, where you were kids, you, you went into the park, uh, you went into the sandbox, but each kid has its own sandbox. It's like a, an imaginary square where all your uh, toys were. 
And obviously you didn't allow anyone to touch your toys, okay? Because small kids are very selfish. Okay, so that's a, a, a sandbox, okay? So what's in your sandbox, it's only yours. What's in other sandboxes is the property of others. So each function behaves like a sandbox. All the variables that you define here in main are local, which means are available. They exist only in the main sandbox. And this is the same story here. Now, if I would define this as global variables, that will be a different story because now I could have uh, 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 um, uh, ambiguous compiler errors, okay, when I will use them. But like I said, we will never do that. Okay, so all the variables defined in a function, inside the function body, they are local for that function. Let's just repeat this because this is the way it will always happen. Okay, so how do we call the function sandbox? How do we call this space, which is specific to this function and maybe this function um, um, in terms of memory? This sandbox is called a stack, okay? So all the functions that we will write, all the functions that you have written uh, uh, up to this point, they were managing these variables on a space which is associated to those functions is like a one-to-one -one relation. Each function has its own stack and all the local variables, they exist there, okay? On that stack, okay? So this is called the memory space used by functions to manage their variables. Now, all the variables defined here are on the do something function stack and also all the values which are defined here in the input list or in the input arguments list, like int input value, okay? So input value is on the do function stack and these values uh, variables are on the do something uh, stack. So that's why we don't have any issues with the compiler because this variable is the variable from do something stack. And this variable is the one from main, despite the fact that they have the same name, but the, for, for the compiler, they don't have the same name. This is the unintegral value. Okay, here will be like this unintegral value. This will be the unintegral value for do something. And this one will be from main. Okay, so all the variables from a function and from its uh, uh, input arguments list are on uh, that function stack. Okay, so this is the way our programs are, are handling uh, the variables, okay? And this is important to remember that that memory space is called a stack. Okay, so we have these variables now. We know that each variable here, this is an integer, which means it can handle values which are stored uh, on a four byte um, uh, space, okay? Because that's the size of an integer, 32 bits or four bytes. This is a variable that can store a single byte. And again here, this is a part of the recap. Now, a char, a char variable, we all know that it can be initialized with because it's a char. You see, this is another assumption that we, uh, we do, but it's actually wrong because we always say that the char variable can store only letters like A, for example. Okay, because we are talking about A between simple codes, don't do this mistake. Don't say equals A between double codes because this between double codes, you see it's a char array of two. So this is actually an array of two chars. You see it here, char array of two values. And obviously here it's only one char. How can you store two, two chars into one? That's the issue. You can't copy a char array. Now, why this is a char array? Uh, because we are using double codes. Okay, that was not the question, sorry. The question is why this has two chars and this one has only one. Does anyone know? Does the second one store the null? Exactly, which is the null terminating symbol for strings, which yeah. is actually called backslash zero. So it contains the zero byte, which means a byte with all the value zero, all the bits zero, contains the zero byte at the end uh, of the array. 
okay? And that's called Bexley Zero, okay? So if you want to use it, if you want to play with it, uh, this is your value uh, a, as an escape value, okay? Bexley Zero between uh, simple codes, okay? So you, we can use it. And that's why this has uh, two, two bytes, two charts. Okay, so don't make this confusion. A single char between double codes is actually an array, and this is actually a single char. Okay, now, uh, regarding chars, the false uh, assumptions that we do is that uh, it's used only to store letters, okay, let's say. But actually, a char is an integer value stored on only one byte. And because it's actually an integer value, I can store values in it, okay? Because this is actually what a char is. Now, in, uh, in Java, the equivalent of a char is not char because in Java, you, you will see it has only two, it has two bytes. Uh, the equivalent is the byte type, which does not exist in C and C++ because uh, char has, is the, actually the one byte data type and it's used to store numbers. Now, this works. We can store letters because letters are actually numbers, you know? And those numbers are predefined. So when you say A, you're actually saying a number, which will always be associated with small a. And if you want to see that number, uh, you just need to search for ASCII table. And if you search for ASCII table, you will see a table like this one. So actually when you say a char variable equals small a between simple codes, it's a fancy way of saying that you store into that variable uh, 97, okay? Because all the letters, all the symbols in the ASCII table are actually numbers. So yeah, it will be very difficult for humans to memorize the decimal code or all the ASCII table symbols, okay? But we know the symbols because we know the Latin alphabet. We, we use it on daily basis. So that's why we can use the um, uh, ASCII table symbol, but actually in memory, we are actually storing this number. So if I will write G, it will be 103. And if I uh, initialize a, a char variable with a number, like uh, let's say 109, this is actually saying M, okay? So if I go back to uh, this and say a char variable equals 108, this is actually AKA equals M, okay? Because that's the ASCII code of small m. So this is just a convention. That's why they are allowing us to use uh, uh, letters because it will be other difficult to actually play with uh, ch characters. But remember, they are numbers. So a char variable is a numeric type, is used to store numbers, small char? numbers. Yeah. So in this case, why an integer, for example, cannot contain a letter as well if we're talking about numbers? Uh, an integer? Yeah, like... Who says this? So let's say an integer value equals A. Who says we can't? Let's see, build, rebuild. One succeeded, let's print it. See out. The number is, an integer. So let's see what we'll print, build, rebuild. So debug, start without debugging. Let me show you the screen. What do you see? The number is? 97. 97. So letters are actually what? Numbers. And they are always numbers. And they were actually from the beginning of computer science numbers. We were actually living a lie. So eventually truth uh, has came true. Yes. <laughs> okay. So that's why you can always store an integer, uh, a num a letter into any integer type because they are actually numbers. Now, why we can't store an integer into a char? Why do you think we can't? Have, do you have any idea or anyone has any idea why we can't store uh, an integer? It's too large. Exactly, because I just told you. An integer has four bytes. A char has only one byte. How can you squeeze four bytes over one in memory? You can't. That's why we can't the opposite because the integer is too big. Now you see uh, storing a char into an integer has, is no issue because it's like storing one byte over four bytes, which 
it will always replace the first one. So okay. the reason we use uh, char is because there is no point in using it. Uh, like yeah, because we are humans and because we are very lousy of playing with numbers. Yeah. That's the reason. Okay. Uh, the ASCII value is larger than a byte. That's a very good question. Let's see. Let's find the, the answer. So if we go back to um, uh, Firefox, yeah, Firefox crashed. Okay, so the question from uh, Theodore was, uh, if the ASCII value is larger than a byte, uh, what's the biggest value in the standard ASCII table? What's the value? 127. What's the biggest value that you can write uh, on a byte with a sign? 127. And you see, there is no coincidence. And uh, now you, you should understand why for managing special symbols, like symbols from uh, different languages, you need an extended ASCII table. So the question, uh, my question to you is, when we will write a software program and when we will store C, is that value stored on a classic chart or not? We will need an unsigned char. Uh, exactly. Or maybe we need uh, we need two bytes because maybe the extended ASCII table contains besides Romanian uh, special symbols, I don't know, Chinese special symbols, German, French, whatever. Or we can use it on an unsigned because on, un on uh, unsigned, uh, we can store values from zero to 255. So uh, on an unsigned char, we can actually use uh, we can actually use an ASCII table with double the size of the classic ASCII table. But generally, they will use uh, two byte chars because uh, you, you don't have only Romanian language. You have a lot of special symbols in the world in different languages. So an extra ASCII table will not be sufficient. Okay, you need more than that. Okay, so uh, char variables are numbers and they are all numbers. And yeah. We can use these uh, um, predefined codes like letters and symbols, but like I said, this is just a convention. So this is a very important stuff uh, that we uh, we should realize that they are all values. So uh, because a char variable is a number, does this mean strange now? Uh, plus equals ten, which means I will add ten to let's say a char variable, which initially was uh, M. Does this make uh, uh, look strange? No, because if a char variable has been initialized with uh, let's say uh, M initially here, okay, then it will take the ASCII code from M, which is 108. So by adding 10, we get 118 and that's it. But if I want to print it, What's the corresponding ASCII table symbol for 118? Will be this value, which is V. So I, I, I can actually uh, do interchanges. For example, uh, how can I replace small m uh, with its uh, capital counterpart? So I see I have 109 here, and the ASCII code here is 77. So I just need to uh, subtract from 109 this difference. And by doing that uh, subtraction, I can replace small letters with capital letters because they are all numbers. It's just a convention. Okay, so this is about uh, chair variables. So let's say here becomes V, uh, small v. Okay, now what are pointers? Okay, because, okay, we know normal variables, but what's the idea with pointers? Okay, why they are so scary? So we have all these variables here, which are placed on those function stacks, okay? So what's so special about pointers? Pointers. So let's start with the definition of a pointer. So a pointer is actually a variable. Okay, so until now, it's just a variable. So let's name it a pointer variable. Okay, variable. Okay, great. So nothing scary about it. It's just a variable like this one and this one and this one. So pointers are variable, which are used to store numbers 
okay, nothing scary now because we have seen here a lot of variables which we are not afraid of, which are used to store numbers. And now this is also included in this group because the char is actually a numeric variable. So at this perspective, a pointer is like any normal variable. And we need to say this many times because pointers are as any other variables. They are used to store numbers, like an int, like a char, like a short int. Okay, so pointers are variables used to store numbers. Great. So if I will add 10 to this variable, let's define a variable here. Let's say number of students. If I say uh, int number of students equals 10, or let's say uh, 108, okay? Let's use the previous example. What it means for us? It means that in our program, at some point, we will manage 108 students. Great. Now, what will happen if I store in this char, var char variable again, 108? Maybe based on, uh, on the ASCII table, this means I want to, to save here, to store here the ASCII code of, because I already know it, of a small m, okay? So that will be a meaning of this line. And here I have 108 students to manage. Great. So every time we store numbers into this kind of variables, they have a meaning, okay? They are actually an ASCII code, a letter, a number of something that we will manage. So what will happen if I store here 108? Because like I said, the pointer, it's a variable which is used to store numbers. It means I want to store this number. Yeah, but what means for a pointer? And the only thing that makes the big difference between a pointer and a variable, you see the definition, uh, the definition up to this point is the same for any other variables, is this one, which represent addresses. Okay, so pointers are like, any other variables you, which are storing numbers, but those numbers are not 108 students. That number is not the ASCII code of M. In our mind, the meaning of this number that we want to store into a, a pointer is an address, which represents an address. And an address is a number. So in order for our processor to uh, uh, get data, write data into RAM, it's using addresses. And an address is a number, okay? It's like you live on the same street. It's in the same RAM uh, memory, okay? So they don't have names, they have only numbers, okay? Now, so we understand that they are like other variables, but uh, that number represents an address, great. Now, how do we define a pointer? Because generally, when we define an integer web variable, we used int. When we have defined a char variable, I use the char. When I'm defining another type of a variable, I use float. So how can we define pointers? Because you see, they are like others, but they have this, which represent an address. Okay, so in order to distinguish them from normal variables, which are used for other purposes, okay, they are using this special syntax. And they are saying, hey, because this is a special variable, it's not like any other variables used to store numbers, because it's representing an address, not number, let's use an asterisk. So asterisk is actually the signature of pointers. Now we know asterisk is also the multiplication, but when it's used here, when you define a variable, it's a pointer, great. Now you see the compiler is saying, yeah, but that's not enough. Because generally when you want to store an address, that address belongs to something, to someone. Right? It's just, it's not just an address. It's the address of something that you want to reach. It's like sending a letter. You, you write the address, but also they will ask you the name of the destination, the person that will receive that. Okay? Because an address is something not human. Okay? It's, it's just an address. So here the compiler will always say, hey, can you give me some hints regarding what's there at, at that address? So we know that in memory, at store what? Variables. So right now the compiler is saying, hey, will you use this pointer to store an address of what? Now, if you are not decided, 
And if you want to say to the compiler, hey, I, I'm not decided. I, I just want to store a generic address. I don't have the, the type of that thing is there. In order to say that, we have a keyword, which we can use also for functions. And generally, void means nothing. So right now, we are actually saying to, uh, uh, to the compiler, hey, this is a pointer to an address of any type, which means I don't care what's there, if it's a student or it's a professor or it's a char or it's an integer. It's just something there. I know it's there in memory. I just want to have its address, 108. So when you define pointers with a void here and an asterisk, this is actually a generic pointer. It's a pointer to anything is the generic pointer. And my colleagues in next semester will say, hey, remember void asterisks from C++? In Java, we have object. And my colleagues from uh, Windows will say, hey, remember that in C Sharp, we have object, which is the generic reference. OK, so void asterisk is actually a way to say to the compiler, hey, this is not just a variable is a pointer variable. So all the values that I will store here will be uh, addresses. And, and now I don't know what's there. So this is a generic pointer. OK, now the compiler, because playing with addresses is very dangerous because it's very powerful. So if we have the ability to write a for loop, which will go from 0 to the maximum address of RAM, and we will check the address of each byte and dump those bytes into a file. What do we get? So if I go from zero to the maximum address uh, in RAM, which are numbers, I can determine them. And I check each byte there. I will check each byte address, read that byte and dump it into a file. What do we get into that file? What do you think we get? Any idea? The whole memory? Exactly. We, we get a snapshot of all the memory, which is right now at that particular uh, uh, moment uh, existing in RAM. And if you have a password manager, which uh, you open it, you store, you type the master password in order to access your passwords easily. Where are those now running? Where is that process running in RAM? So if I do a snapshot of all everything which is in RAM and I see a lot of strings, what are those? Maybe your passwords, okay? So if you do a dump of the entire RAM, you get a lot of interesting stuff because everything goes through RAM, including sensitive data. Okay, now what's preventing us to do that? The operating system. And you know which routine? The one that says, hey, you are a normal user your program tries to read the entire RAM and dump it, but uh, it's running under a normal user rights. So what I need to do in order to be allowed to do that, I need to run that program with admin rights. And if I can do that, that's it. I have full control. I can read the entire RAM. And this is, our, is actually the power of pointers. And you can do that in C and C++. Uh, obviously, operating systems are becoming smarter and smarter. A common user will not try to do this or a common application, maybe a malware, but you can still trick the operating system. And you can do this in C and C++ because if I write a number into an address, into a pointer, I can read the value from there. The only question for me is, why do I want to see RAM at address 108? Because maybe, I don't know, I know it's something interesting there. So you see now the compiler is saying, hey, 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 that's dangerous because it's very powerful. And they, they just introduced this, but this is only for naive programmers. So right now they are saying, hey, this is an int asterisk value, which means this is a, uh, uh, it's a void asterisk value, which means this is a, um, uh, it's a pointer which can store uh, an address to anything. And now you want to copy an integer there. So the two types, mm, they, they don't look the same. So you have an integer here, and this is a pointer to anything. But in C and C++, you have this magic tool, magic one, which is called the cast operator. And this overrides all the rules that the compiler knows. So what's the problem of the compiler? It's saying, 
this is an int and I can't copy it over a void asterisk. Okay, let's make them the same type. This is the power of the cast operator. So right now I'm saying to the compiler, hey, you see this is not an int. It's a pointer to anything. So just copy this value into this because they have the same type. So right now I just copy 108 here. And now using the pointers syntax, I can actually read and write from this address in RAM. Like I said, the only problem that I have now, it's called the operating system, which may allow me or not to see what's here. But at some point you can trick it, uh, but you need to uh, spend a lot of effort. So if I try to see what's in memory at that address, so let's see, C out and line, the value from RAM at address 108 in decimal is, so right now I need to print the value, the value there. So if I write here a pointer variable, you see the compiler is saying, okay, I have no issue with that. Build, rebuild. Okay, it's passing the compiler. Now let's run this. Debug, start without debugging. So I am running this. The processor, it's the operating system uh, sometimes and Windows Defender will see that something strange is happening. Okay, so it's thinking for a moment, hey, what this guy is doing, okay? Why is storing an address there, whatever? So this is Windows Defender. Sometimes it's trying to figure it out what, what I'm trying to do, especially when you play with pointers. And for some of you, uh, if you are using another antivirus like Bdefender, at some point you will be forced to, I don't know, to make an exception for the folder in which you develop this kind of apps, normal apps, not, not viruses. Because uh, playing with pointers is, is dangerous. Okay, so let's try to run it again because um, uh, I will force the stop. Let's try debug, start without debugging. Okay, let's uh, share it again. So you see the value from RAM at address 108 is 00066C. So what's this? This is a value in hexadecimal. Okay, remember uh, that you need to remember hexadecimal. So it's showing me this hexadecimal value 00006C because if you go now and open the computer and try to see uh, what's the value of 6C in decimal, this is 108. So this is the hexadecimal representation of 108. So why it's showing me that in memory at address 108, it's still 108 in hexadecimal. So the coincidence is too big, right? There is no coincidence, let's say in programming. So this is too strange. And I realized that here, we are not actually printing the value which is in RAM at that address. We are actually printing the pointer variable, okay? I'm just printing it as a number of students. And that's why I see the number in uh, hexa. So every time you will run programs, and you see values in hexa in your console, you are actually printing the value of the pointer. You're not printing the value which is in RAM at the address given by the pointer, okay? So just uh, remember this. So how do we see uh, what's there in memory? Remember the syntax? You need to use an asterisk because using an asterisk now, before a pointer, this is actually uh, saying, hey, I, I don't want to see the value of the pointer. I want to see what's there in RAM at that address. And this is again by using asterisk, okay? So the pointer without the asterisk is actually the value of itself. It's like a variable, normal variable, but this does the entire magic. An asterisk here will now try to sh uh, print us uh, what's there, okay? And this makes the difference. Okay, and generally we will want to do this, okay, to see what's there uh, at different addresses. Now the compiler is again saying, hey, I can't show you uh, what's there in memory because you said this is a pointer to anything. So how do I know when to stop? Because I can stop after a byte and this is printing a char value. I can stop after two bytes and this is printing two short uh, a short integer. I can stop after four bytes, that's an integer. I can stop after eight bytes, which is a long integer. 
okay? Or I can stop after 10 bytes, which is a long, long, okay? That's the biggest uh, integer value that we have, long, long, without int. That's a 10 byte integer, okay? So now the compiler is saying, great, but you said that's nothing there. So how do I know when to stop? Do I need to stop after one byte, two bytes, four bytes, eight bytes? And you see, that's why it's important. And with this, I will uh, finish. When we define pointers to actually say, hey, this is a pointer which will manage an address of an integer because later we want to see that integer. Okay, so this is a pointer to an integer. A pointer to an integer. Okay, and uh, if I want to define a pointer to a char, I will say char asterisk, a pointer to a char. So this is where this matters because defining a pointer, you don't need to say the type, okay? You just need to say it's a pointer to anything I would like, okay? So the type, this type here will matter because later we will want to see that integer. We want to see that chart, okay? And you see, it doesn't matter when, where you write the pointer. So you can write it like this. You can write it like this, okay? Generally, I will write them like this because you see it's like a pointer to an int or a point to a char, okay? So this is my way, but you can use uh, other, the other version. So when we see out, we have to actually, instead of a pointer variable, we have to write a pointer to an integer? Uh, exactly, because right now the compiler is saying, I can't, I, I don't know uh, what to instruct the processor. Hey, show the value at address 108 and stop after how many bytes? So the type of the pointer here is actually used to access the value there. So let's initialize the pointer to an integer to the same address. Let's see what's the integer in RAM at value 108. Okay, again, the compiler is saying, yeah, but this is an integer. Here you have a pointer to integer. Okay, let's override this rule. And that's why if, you, if we don't understand pointers, you will mess them up by just overwriting them, by using cast. And you will be happy you fix the compiler error, but later you will, you will feel the pain because the program will crash and you have no idea uh, how to fix it because, I don't know, this was by just guessing. Let's write that. Maybe it works. Yeah, but when we say maybe it works, you refer to um, uh, removing the compiler error, okay? And removing the compiler error will not fix the program. It's just one step. Okay, so right now you see I'm saying, hey, this is a, this value 108 is actually the address of an integer in RAM. I know it's there and that in integer is valuable to me. So here we are printing. So this is not the value from RAM at address 100. Okay, this is actually, you see the pointer value. So remember, if you see values in hexa in the console, you see the pointer value. You forgot the asterisk. You see the pointer value. Okay, so in order to actually see the value there, let's use the uh, pointer to an integer. So I need to use this asterisk. Okay, so because asterisk pointer means the value at that address. So build rebuild. Okay, debug, start without debugging, brace for impact. And we will see again the now it's even much more dangerous. The I think Windows Defender is going crazy. It's just saying, what what's that address? Why is it trying to do that? Okay, let's try again. It's blocking the, the console. So I need to stop it and uh, run it again. Start without debugging. Okay, so let's see. The value from RAM at address uh, 108 is, this is, remember, this is from the previous. Yeah, but don't get fooled by our, our own program. Someone is saying, I'm, I'm still seeing 0006C. Uh, uh, yeah, but this is this one here, you see? I didn't comment it, this one here. Okay, now let's check together this line here. What do we see here? Exit Not zero. code, exactly. So what just happened? This process was a very bold process. It just said to the operating system, hey, show me what you have in RAM at this address. And this is a very low address. This is a very restricted area. Maybe here is the kernel space. 
of the operating system. So yeah, this is very boldly to us to see. So what the operating system has just done, it said, yeah, okay, let's terminate you. Okay, so it terminated the process, okay, with an exit code. Always check your exit code. Now, if I run this again in um, debugger, so debug, start debugging, let's see the real error. Let's see the programmer's view. You see the problem is here and it's saying read access violation. You are not allowed to go here, 0xc5. Okay, now if we run this program with admin rights or at let's say kernel space level, then yeah, we can see that address, but this is uh, out of scope of this uh, course. Okay, generally we will behave properly. We will generally check addresses which belong to us. So in order to just close the, the course, sorry for eating you, uh, taking also the, the break. So how do we will behave through the, through the semester? Let's stop the debugger. Generally, we will not try to guess addresses. Okay, we will not randomly try to see what's there in RAM because like I said, this is, uh, th that will be the purpose of another course. Generally, we will try to use addresses which belong to us, which we are allowed to see because the operating system will say, hey, that's your variable. You can see the, its address, you can use its address. So the only way to get addresses for variables you, uh, you can check in memory is to ask a variable for its address. So if I write this, a pointer to an integer equals number of students, again, the compiler will say, yeah, but this is a pointer to a, an int, this is an int. So if you just memorize my examples and you just say, let's try, let's fix the compiler error and you write this, I don't think this is what you wanted to do because by writing this, you remove the compiler error, but in the end, this is like writing 108 into the pointer as an address. And we are not just allowed to, do, to go there. So remember that if you want to, to take the address of something and that thing will be variable, a variable, we use this other special character, which is the end. And now a pointer to an integer will take the value of the address of number of students. So if you are curious to see where number of students is in memory right now. So let's say the address of, of the number of students variable is, just print the pointer, okay? We need to comment this one because this will crash the program always. Okay, so we need to comment that one. Uh, build, rebuild. Okay, and if I will run it, start without debugging. Now the Windows Defender has no issue. You see, this is my address. Now, if you see here a different value, we are okay. If you see the same value, please call me. It means our machines are interconnected through time and space, which is quite something. But generally you'll see here a different address. Okay, because I don't know, you have a different memory, you have other processes there. So if you see here a different number, you are okay. Okay, so these are actually the uh, pointers. So in order to end the, the course, pointers are variables which are used to store numbers, but those numbers represent not students, not a Nashi code, not, I don't know, a price, is always an address. And we can actually check what's at different locations in RAM by using pointers if, you, if we know those addresses. Okay, so at this point you may say, yeah, but why to have this, uh, I don't know, issue? Why we can't use number of students? Okay, why do you need the pointer to an integer to get the address of number of students? Why you don't play with number of students? So this is like, uh, this is an argument for those of you who are saying is trying to fail us, is tricking us, don't believe me, okay? So pointers are dangerous. Okay, so yeah, that's a good question. Why are we not using number of students? Why do we need pointers? Because we have the variable. It's safe to play with variables. The answer is 
let's go back to what we started talking earlier. These variables from main are visible only to main. These variables from do something are visible only to do something. So can we make a, a function to actually access a variable from another sandbox? Officially not, because each function has its own sandbox. Yeah, but can we do it with a pointer? The answer is yes. You only need the address of these variables from here or variables from here. And that's why we need pointers because writing programs that use only the local variables, writing functions that use only the, the variables defined on that function stack will not allow us to build complex programs. And we want the power to be able to play with other functions variables. And in order to do that, we need their addresses. And which variable do we need in order to store their addresses? A pointer. So that's why we need pointers, because without pointers, we are not using the entire language, the entire power of the language. It's like we are limiting ourselves. And we will try to do stuff which can be easily do, uh, done with pointers in very difficult way. OK, so um, the story is not finished here because we will continue the discussion with this. How can we use pointers to actually uh, get access to other functions variables? OK, so the next course will be transferring uh, parameters to functions. Okay, and I will show you again uh, the power of, um, uh, of pointers.